For a final panel for this uh, this afternoon, we will be joined by John Trapagan, is that uh, mm -hmm. proper way to pronounce it, uh, who will discuss anthropology at a distance, a SETI and the production of knowledge in the encounter with an extraterrestrial other. John is Professor of Religious Studies and Anthropology and Faculty Affiliate at the Population Research Center. He received his PhD from the University of Pittsburgh in Social Anthropology, holds an MAR degree from Yale University in Ethics and a BA in Political Science from the University of Massachusetts at Lowell. His postdoctoral research was conducted as at a National Institute on Aging Postdoctoral Fellow at the Population Studies Center of the University of Michigan. Dr. Trapagan research interests center on the relationship between culture and science. His past work has focused largely on medical concepts and religion in Japan. Currently, its primary research focuses on the application of uh, anthropological ideas within the field of astrobiology. His most recent book uh, in is Extraterrestrial Intelligence and Human Imagination, SETI and the Intersection of Science, Religion and Culture, 2014. Previous books include Rethinking Autonomy, A Critic of Principalism in Biomedical Ethics, 2013, Taming Oblivion, Aging Bodies and the Fear of Senility in Japan, 2000, and The Practice of Concern, Ritual Well-Being in Aging in Rural Japan, 2004. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to raise some questions related to thinking about anthropology and what we've been doing here. And quick, which one's the anthropologist? <laughs> Why are you laughing? We assume everyone knows, right? But the question is, why do you know? You know because you can fill in all the blanks. And there's a whole bunch of stuff encoded in that picture that tells you which one the anthropologist is. I'm interested here in talking a little bit about how thinking about the history of anthropology and thinking about working with alien others among anthropologists, cultural anthropologists, gives us a framework for thinking about interstellar message construction. And, and I'm interested in asking what kinds of things can we imagine about the interpreting side based upon our own experiences. And that, of course, comes back to thinking about our own side of this. What I want to ask in terms of how cultural anthropology comes into this is how do existing theories and ideas influence how we think about others and how we construct the nature of others? So, that's where I'm going to go. Um, obviously, the Western imagination has had quite an influence on thinking about other peoples. Uh, if you think about the way we've exoticized other kinds of people and we've thought about them as being alien, one of the things that happened frequently early in contact with Europeans and the rest of the world was that people were described as being cannibals. Almost anybody who was different was a cannibal and therefore scary, problematic. Now, the meaning of cannibal is not a neutral thing. It's culturally constructed. Europeans described others as cannibals, but in the Middle Ages, Europeans were cannibals by some definitions because they ingested ground human bones for medicinal purposes. So what constitutes a cannibal depends upon your perspective on cannibalism. When we think about the nature of how others were conceptualized, there were lots of different perspectives. Um, they were dangerous, they were uncivilized, there was the idea of the noble savage which raised them in some respects sort of more pure than civilized humans but also sometimes presented them as being little more than part of the flora and fauna of the environments that the Europeans were coming into. Now this isn't a one-way street, all right? When we encounter other people we create a construction of what they are and I think a great example of this is um, Commodore Perry, this was raised earlier a little bit about Japan, and in, in 1852, in a kind of classic example of American diplomacy, Commodore Perry sailed into the harbor at Tokyo and said to the Japanese, trade with us or we'll blow you up. And so they gave up because they hadn't been really developing any weapons technology for 250 years, and they opened up. So that's 
a picture of him from the US. This is one way that they represented Commodore Perry. Well, that's pretty good. It looks a lot like him. Eyebrows might be a little bit thick. But this is another example. I guess ugly is in the eye of the beholder. Um, he uh, actually looks an awful lot like demons that you see in various kinds of Japanese art. And so uh, this is, I think, a kind of demonized representation of what he was. The interesting thing here is, of course, the beard that gets kind of added in. I don't know, maybe he grew that while he was there. I don't know what the history exactly of this is. But the point is, when you look at others, you construct them. We all do this. We construct them in an image that we um, generally create. So if we think about anthropology, um, there are certain kinds of analogs to the whole SETI enterprise. And, and if we go back to the 19th century, you have um, what's often referred to by anthropologists today as armchair anthropology. And um, this involved research at great distance. The anthropologists in the middle to late second half of the 19th century couldn't really go to a lot of the places they went to. There were long time delays in terms of getting um, information. There were unreliable modes of communication. Um, there was not much direct contact between the anthropologists and the people that they were studying. Um, usually what anthropologists did is things like writing letters to missionaries and other people in other parts of the world and ask them to collect data. And I'll give you an example of that. Colony offic colonial officials were involved. Military personnel no, were involved. And of course, you know, these are all very objective and unbiased people in terms of collecting data. So there's a lot we can rely on deeply there. Um, a lot of this surrounded thinking about what civilization was. And I think a good example of this comes in the work of Lewis Henry Morgan. Morgan is um, hes really the father of the study of kinship in American anthropology. He's a key figure in the development of, of anthropology in the United States. And he had this big project where he sent letters out all around the world and collected different systems of how people reckon kinship. And what happened is that when the data came back to these anthropologists, what they often did was they interpret the, interpreted the data on theoretical and frame, uh, frameworks and assumptions that were typical of Western social science at the time. And central to this was social Darwinism and ideas about cultural evolution. Um, typically, people like Morgan applied notions like survival of the fittest to human, social, and political organizations, structures, and developed an idea that human societies progress through stages of development through a process of evolution that was supposed to be like what goes on in biological evolution. And this is what Morgan came up with. This is his model of social evolution. We get a set of stages, lower savagery, middle savagery, upper savagery, lower barbarism, middle barbarism, and upper barbarism, and then, of course, civilization. And these are all defined in terms of technological features of change. They're not defined in terms of, of other kinds of things. They focus on technological change, although this then gets extrapolated into thinking in terms of things like moral change. There are a whole bunch of assumptions floating around in this. One, in the cultural evolu evolution model, there's an idea that progress is directional. As societies evolve, in other words, change, they get better. And that there's an, an end point. And of course, in the 19th century, the end point, end point was 19th century Europe. That was, that was the direction everything was supposed to go. Social organization and moral abilities tend to get equated with technological advancement. So the primary measure of improvement is increased technology. And an advanced society or a developed society is seen as one that is technologically beyond, you know, or has moved beyond um, some past society. Now, there are all kinds of problems with this. I, it's, it's, I'll get into a few of them here. But um, first off, terms like savagery and barbarism and civilization are very value-laden ideas. They're embedded with moral assumptions. They are not neutral, and they weren't at the time that these anthropologists were writing. Um, they set up relationships between what's deemed backwards and undeveloped and uncivilized versus what's civilized. And they also tend to um, 
have quite a bit of complex meaning related to notions about moral development. So which type is morally inferior, which type is morally superior. Um, these are not simple. They're very complicated ideas. And again, sometimes you have ideas like the noble savage emerging. But most of all, what happens is an idea that civilization, meaning Europe, is superior to the things that have come before it. There are lots of problems with this. Um, by the early part of the 20th century, anthropologists like Franz Boas were panning this model, saying that, no, this does not reflect what we understand about different systems of social organization. And if we simply look around, we can see that tribal societies exist within state-level societies, so there isn't a linear progression. You can look at the Kung Bushmen in Botswana or Angola. And so-called primitive behaviors of forms of social organization continue to operate. We can look at gangs as examples of clan-based or tribal forms of social organization. They use secret symbols. They use totems um, to identify membership. And you can even look at things like the mascot of the University of Texas, where I teach. And you know we can think of this as a totem, right? Uh, so you can't look at this in a linear way. Basically, what you've got is you've got lots of different things all happening at the same time. And, and human civilizations may progress technologically. We can't easily say the same thing in terms of social organization. They change, but that does not necessarily imply progress. So armchair anthropology kind of came to an end in the early 20th century. And this is a result of improved communication, improved transportation. Um, and people started going out doing field work. Bronislaw Malinowski in the early part of the 20th century went and lived among the Trobrian Islanders and initiated an entirely different way of doing f research, where you actually went and lived the life of the people as much as you could where you were and tried to learn that way instead of trying to have people send you information. But the anthropology at a distance approach didn't completely end. And what I want to talk about for the rest of this talk primarily here is an example of this and how this developed from an intellectual history perspective in anthropology. I'm going to talk about Ruth Benedict's work during World War II studying Japan. And she wound up doing anthropology at a distance. She was an anthropologist actually trained by Franz Boas. She worked largely among the Hopi until World War II. And then in the early 1940s, the United States commissioned her to do a study of Japanese culture. This was because Japanese behavior didn't make much sense to Americans. Things like kamikaze and other, other actions that really just were bewildering to Americans seemed to demand an explanation. So the US government went to Benedict and said, figure this out for us, because by the time, actually 1944 or so, when she was commissioned, it was becoming increasingly clear that we would win the war and we would occupy Japan and we would have to understand this country. Now, gathering data is a little bit difficult, right? Y you know, she couldn't drop into Japan in 1944 and say, do you mind if I do an ethnographic study of your society so that when we beat you up, we can know what to do with you? There was no way for her to do ethnography. So she had really difficult situation in terms of collecting data. So the answer to this was to look at things like Japanese literature, Japanese films, things that were translated. Actually, Benedict did not know the Japanese language, so that presented a bit of a problem for her. Um, you can see here, this is actually a kind of an interesting example of the representation of an alien other. Does anyone know who the guy there with the knife is? That's Tojo. He really looked like this. Whoops. Not quite the same there. Um, this was a very difficult environment, right? So what she did, because she couldn't go there, was she did the next best thing. She interviewed Americans of Japanese descent living in relocation camps in the desert southwest. Now, this is all kinds of problems. First of all, it was research on prisoners. The context in which they were living had little or nothing to do with Japan. This isn't how people in Japan live. Um, 
the respondents were passive because they were speaking with a representative of the exact government that had forcibly removed them from their homes and put them into these concentration camps. So they didn't really want to talk to her in the first place. And then, of course, they weren't Japanese. They were Japanese Americans for the most part. They were American citizens, second, third generation. They were not people who actually had experience living in Japan. Now, why is that important? Well, after the war, Benedict published a book called The Chrysanthemum and the Sword that was based upon the report that she gave to the United States government. This is a really important book. It sold widely in the United States. It actually was translated and may have even sold more widely in Japan, which is kind of interesting. No single book has had more influence on our understanding of Japan than Benedict's book. It is consistently cited and has been for a long time when talking about what Japanese culture is. In fact, right after it was published, these were some of the reactions to it. A guy named John Embre, who was an eminent anthropologist at Yale, who had done the first ethnography ever published on Japan in the 1930s, wrote, Dr. Benedict, with the soft words of a fox spirit, leads the reader into the forest of Japan, and before he knows it, she has bewitched, or has him bewitched into believing that he understands and is familiar with every root and branch of Japanese culture. I actually thought that was sarcastic the first time I read it, but he meant it. He goes on to, uh, he, he, he really meant, in fact, there he wrote two book reviews, both of which laud this book as an extraordinary example of understanding Japanese culture. Um, another one, 1947, the most important contemporary book yet written on Japan here for the first time is a serious attempt to explain why the Japanese behave the way they do, which is really weird from an American perspective. So. This is how it was actually taken after the war, which is intriguing because she didn't do a study of Japanese people. And there were a few book reviews that came out that noted this and then just jumped right over it and just kept on going and said, yep, here we go. We learned about Japan. So what are the problems with Benedict's work? There's a lack of valid empirical data, to, um, and she has, which led to an emphasis of theory over description. She didn't describe what she saw very well because she was focused on theory. She tried to fit Japanese culture into a theoretical framework she had actually developed earlier in her research, which re relates to modal personalities and the idea of how these then map into different cultural groups. I don't want to go into all that. Um, there was a need for a very practical and usable description of Japanese culture and behavior for the US government and the general public, and that guided the way that she went about doing her research. So there were pragmatic things behind her work. This led to a tendency to create stereotypes and simplistic ideas about Japan, such as Japan being a groupist society, that loyalty is deeply important to Japanese. And you have things like the samurai ethic and a suicide society. There's a long list of stereotypes about Japan, uh, none of which very accu accurately reflect what goes on there. So the key point here is that what became understood as Japanese culture wasn't an accurate representation. Japanese culture was, in part, the product of the Western imagination. It was not just going out and studying it. Now, if the book had just been kind of dropped on its own and said, OK, well, that was really about people living in concentration camps that weren't Japanese, that would be fine. But that's not what happened. It became the book about Japan. So when we think about culture, we need to think about imagination and think about how we conceptualize other people in terms of our own imagination. An anthropologist named Arjun Apadurai argues that imagination isn't just an individual practice, it's a social practice. And the ability to engage in imaginative activity is what he calls an organized field of social practices. This allows us to shape and negotiate fields of possibilities to think about what we might be, think about what we want, but it also limits the scope of what we can imagine. We we can only go so far based upon those limitations. So the, processing, the process of imagining leads to what he calls imaginaries, or constructed social and cultural landscapes that reflect our collective interests, desires, ideas, and goals.
When we imagine another, we're imagining ourselves as much as we're imagining the other. And this is really the key point. With Benedict's work, that book became the paradigm for the study of Japan. Virtually every scholar, at least up until the 1980s, either worked confirming what she said or worked against what she said. But that book was always at the core. And even today, um, you'll find that book cited regularly. I took a look on um, the Web of Science a little while ago and found this year the book has been cited nine times in psychology journals. And it's often cited unproblematically. It's not raising this as a critical issue. It's saying, see, this is what Japan's like. So we look at this and we can see, I think, a process of inventing Japan. Japan wasn't just discovered through research by Benedict. It was invented. We had an American public that was deeply interested in trying to understand the enemy that they had just conquered and whose country they were occupying. And the added distance take on Japan became Japan itself for many people, and really perhaps the majority of Americans, through most of the second half of the 20th century. And again, Benedict's work was central in the US government's approach to reorganizing and socially engineering Japanese society following the war. This is really important because the US, through the occupation, we didn't just hang out in Japan. We wrote their constitution. And Benedict's work was behind a lot of what got written. So Japan, again, as a culture and as a civilization, wasn't discovered. It was invented. It was a kind of collective fabrication that involved an interplay of theoretical assumptions, political needs, problematic data, and problematic interpretation of her work by other scholars who tended to take it at face value early on. And again, her work continues to be uncritically cited today, which, if you think about it, it it's quite ridiculous. I mean, it's as though Japan hasn't changed since 1946. Um, but somehow that becomes ossified as what Japan is. So what are the implications of this? Well, one implication is that you know, contexts of message, message creation and inter interpretation lead to thinking about questions like what kind of cultural assumptions go into the interpretation of any data that we might receive, and what kind of cultural assumptions go into the creation of a message. Both things are lurking in there. And we tend to use these kinds of frameworks to um, think about what we might interpret and what we might send. I think also we have to think that initial contact with an extraterrestrial intelligence is not simply a moment of discovery. It's a context in which knowledge is generated. It's interpreted and it's augmented and to some extent invented. The meaning and nature of contact with any kind of extraterrestrial will be interpreted and constructed through our own lenses and through our own cultures and through theoretical frameworks that are in vogue among intellectuals at the point in time this happens. That's how we're going to put things together. So you think about Benedict. Benedict was trained as an anthropologist, and she still had difficulty understanding Japanese culture. She got some things right, which is pretty impressive given the way she did it, but she got a lot wrong. It was driven by political need to explain an alien society in a way that would provide a framework for making sense of that society and provide a framework to make it easier for the US government to deal with that society. Would, you, would contact with ETI generate the same kinds of needs? I think, in fact, it probably would. I think we'd have very similar questions coming up. So one of the things I think we can imagine is that if contact happened, it would certainly, I mean, Seth has talked about how rapidly things would become common knowledge. There wouldn't be any secrets about this. And I think the invention of an alien culture will begin almost immediately after contact. That's what will actually transpire. Um, it won't wait for scientists to work through the meanings and implications. That invention will happen at all sorts of different levels. So when we think about anthropology at a distance in the study of Japan, we get this situation where little or no data or earlier anthropology we see um, long, you know, long distances lead to the invention, speculation about the invention of 
the other. And of course, what would happen over a thousand years, say, between contacts? Well, maybe we'd all forget and it really wouldn't make any difference. But I think the vast majority what, of what we will know about ET could be this kind of collective fabrication based on very limited data and then elaborated upon using ethnocentric and anthrocentric theoretical frameworks and assumptions over the long periods of time that might be exist between contact points. So that said, we were told to give recommendations, so I'm going to give a few. I think one thing we can do is develop sophisticated ways of thinking about the potential for anthrocentrism as well as ethnocentrism. I think a lot of this is actually as much ethnocentric from a Western bias as it is anthrocentric. We need to think about how their influence comes into the way we construct images and ideas about extraterrestrial intelligence. And I think one way we can do this is to study the history of contact among human groups. Um, and particularly interesting, I think, is how social scientists have dealt with these kinds of things and how often they've kind of messed things up. So I think we can explore and learn a lot from failures of communication and failures of understanding among different cultures on Earth and between social scientists and the cultures that they've gone to study. I think there's a, a lot of potential there. The other thing is I, I, I like Seth's idea that more is better. Um, one of the problems that I'm pointing here is to here is the inherent bias that lies in all of this stuff, that when we start thinking about things, we're, we're going to interpret them in our own way. Maybe if you just send everything and don't try to interpret anything, you take some of that out. I'm not sure about this, but um, if you don't try to fit it into some kind of theoretical framework and try to figure out how it's going to be interpreted, maybe that just opens the door for the other side to just do whatever they're going to do with it without too much of our imprint on it. Um, I'm, I'm again, I'm not sure about this because I think in the end, without cultural context, interpreting the flood of information is going to be extremely difficult. So um, that's, I think that problem will be there regardless of what we do. Thank you. What about the, um, the inventions on, on the building of, uh, of American culture by Japanese people? Do we have a reverse process? And second question, do you think that uh, we could be uh, in front of an etiocentrism and that we have to, to take that into, into account to communicate with, uh, with ET? Uh, yeah, I think, first of all, sure. Um, I'll give you a good example of, of um, you know, all, all people are always inventing other people's cultures. That's what stereotypes are about. I don't know how many times I've been in Japan and someone has asked me, um, so what kind of gun do you have? Well, all Americans have guns, don't they? Um, so, you know, that, that, that's certainly there. I, um, I think more interesting, actually, is um, that because the chrysanthemum and the sword was translated into Japanese and widely read there, it influenced the formation of Japanese culture following World War II. So the American take on Japan got read by Japanese, and they began, some scholars in particular, began to take that as being representative of what Japan, Japanese culture was about. So I found that to be quite, that's quite an intriguing thing. Um, yeah. Uh, two questions. Did the book actually make it easier for the US government in its dealings with the Japanese? Because they had this model, and even though it was flawed and wrong, that's the way they interacted. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, yes, I would say that it made it easier in the sense that it, it gave them a road map. And as I said, Benedict what didn't get it all wrong. I mean, she, she did pretty well given the circumstances that she was coping with. Um, and, and I think the, the road map was helpful, at least, in coping with Japan following the war. Uh, so, you know, that's kind of an interesting um, issue that, okay, this is pretty imperfect, but it helped, I think maybe the biggest way it helped Americans was that it helped shake them a little bit from their very typical ethnocentrism and go, wow, these people are really different. But what Benedict did do really well was that she noted that they weren't irrational, that it all made sense if you understood the logic. So the key was to break down and understand the logic and then you could make sense of the society. Of course, this is what anthropologists try to do. So.
Yeah. Early in your talk, you, you mentioned this idea of the evolution of civilization. And I wonder, there was an intriguing paper in Nature uh, a couple of weeks ago talking about um, looking at human fossil skulls and looking at the feminization of the features in the skulls and relating um, a, a pressure of larger groups of humans having to live together to a lowering of a level of testosterone and that really there was, there is an evolutionary basis for the structure of civilization. And, the, and I'm wondering, you know, if we go to these mega cities that we're going to be having in the future, whether we will be seeing the same sort of thing. Mm. Oh, I, I think that absolutely, that, you know, change, cultural change has a biological basis. Um, what I meant by that was that um, the idea that civilization is changing in a directional way is problematic. So, you know, for example, you could, you could argue, all right, are we morally superior to the Romans? Well, we're technologically superior, but if you look at the things we do, then the question becomes really problematic because we do all the same kinds of things they did. So you can, you can clearly look at this kind of technological trajectory, but you, it's not easy to do the same thing with ev the evolution, again, meaning just change, not going anywhere, just the evolution of human s societies. Uh, there are lots of different things that happen, and there are certainly new things that will emerge based upon things like megacities and this kind of thing, but I'm not sure that there are improvements. Well, first of all, thank you. Super informative, but I have sort of a vague, uneasy feeling that I can't articulate about simply throwing everything at them at once, and it's, it's sort of based on studies of group problem solving and stuff in management. And there's a certain point at which uh, there's too much information, and in the sense that uh, people will seize on different things. And no, I mean that's our culture, I guess. But at the same time, uh, and, and of course, one can argue that if you don't put it all on the table, what are we hiding? But that, but um, I'm, I'm not convinced personally that uh, giving them all the information available would ease the task. There might be some sort of uh, uh, inverted U curve there. Uh, uh, just, just a thought and reflection on, on your comment. Well, I'm not all that convinced either. I don't want to give Seth too much credit. Um, <laughs> but, because <laughs> he's already got a big enough ego. So. Okay. Um, <laughs> but what I, what I thought was interesting about the idea, actually thought it was interesting for a little, again, a little bit different reason from the re one that Seth raised. For me, what's interesting about that, it, you know, I'm trying to figure out, all right, how do you get our biases out of what we send. And, and I don't know how you do that, because I don't, we don't, everything we do involves bias, right? How do you get that cultural bias out of there? And what intrigued me about Seth's idea is just don't pick. If you don't pick anything, then you maybe have at least reduced that in some way. I think there's still problems because, you know, the internet doesn't have everything on it. So you have all sorts of perspectives that are missed and not included. I mean, you know, poor people who don't have access to Google and all this, they're not involved in that. So I don't think it makes for an unbiased representation, but it does kind of take the conscious picking out of it. But it still may be a bad way to do things. I just, I thought it was a in really interesting idea in terms of thinking about this problem of, of cultural bias. John, uh, oh. I somehow or other keep thinking about an incident that occurs in the original writing of Pinocchio. When he's inside the fish, he meets a tuna fish, and he says, well, it looks like we're done, we're gonna die. And the tuna fish says, well, at least I can control, uh, console myself with the thought that when one is born a tuna fish, it's more honorable to die beneath water than beneath oil. <laughs> Which I think is kind of interesting. <laughs> Pinocchio says, oh, that nonsense, when you die, you're dead. And <laughs> You know, who cares? But the different point of view is kind of, kind of intriguing, I think. Yeah, well, I mean, and there are a lot of different, you know, I, even the, the point that was raised earlier, I, I guess I have to go back and read Pinocchio, but um, the, the, the point even raised earlier about, you know, fear over death, that's, that's not necessarily universal. I'm not convinced that, that every, certainly individuals don't all fear death, and I'm not even sure 
um, societies as a whole necessarily consistently fear death. Or again, what it means to fear death varies a lot from one group to another. Um, it strikes me that uh, we're talking about removing the biases from the communication, but the biases themselves are quite interesting information. Yeah. Um, and I was thinking about how you might uh, get those across. If you gave multiple interpretations of a given topic from as many different perspectives as possible, it could serve as a kind of Rosetta Stone of, of biases. Um, I mean, that's, you've got a lot of representation to get there, but um, it could be kind of interesting. Yeah, I, you know, that, that, that's another question is should we try to remove the bias? And, and I think that's a very reasonable question because that is who we are, right? So uh, I think what I, I'm more concerned about in some ways is um, assumed bias that we're unaware of. I think if we're going to try to construct a message, as opposed to you know Seth's approach, where just throw everything at them, then we've got to think really, really hard about what tacit things are in there that are shaping the way we think about who they are and the way we think about who, what we are. And I, actually, the probably the second of those in some ways is more important. And so, um, you know, having a very overt conscious of, consciousness of this, I think, is really important. So. Um, Again, what I kind of liked about the idea was it, it sort of, it, it, it took that out. But yeah, maybe it's a dumb idea, so. Um. Um, first, I got to do a hearing aid check. <laughs> did you say that you doubted that societies were fearful of death? Or did I doubt that all societies are fearful Okay, of death. I think there's, there's a little development in social psych you might be interested in. It's called terror management theory, and it's based on the work of a somewhat obscure psychoanalyst. There's probably been 300 studies. I'm just making the number up, but there's been hundreds of studies. And uh, what, it, what it tends to show is that there's this all but crippling fear of death that is managed in certain ways, starting with denial and rationalization, and then moving on through a series of psychological and social defenses up to and including, including war. And um, it's, uh, uh, you might want to check it out some, sometime. And it's a, uh, I think it's a very powerful theory uh, because it's backed by about 20 years of research now. Mm -hmm. And it accounts for a lot of human behavior that you would not think would be related in any way, shape, or form to death. Mm -hmm. And it has to do partly with the way we defend our views of ourselves and the world around us. But uh, it, it's quite possible there is no true universal, but this, this thing has been like huge. You know, in social psychology. Mm -hmm. oh, I'll Huge. For that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions, please? Otherwise, this concludes this afternoon's session. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.